And, uh, you know, I'm really grateful for Joel and Courtney just bringing us out here from Chicago. And I bring you greetings from the Causeys and the whole Chicago family. And really, uh, it's just amazing to be uh, with you guys. Uh, the marriage retreat was incredible. I mean, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to add today, but I know the Spirit has something to preach. And uh, we're just grateful. We're grateful for the Hardys. Just what a great job they did at the retreat. You know, the, the campus and the singles, you guys are like looking at us like, well, what's up with those guys? I mean, they, they seem like they're glowing. They're, they're a little bit more radiant than maybe normal. But uh, that's just because we've just had such an amazing spiritual time in the Word, right. in prayer, and with each other. That's and right. our roots are getting interlocked. Amen? Come on. What an incredible image. So, on that great day. That's the title of the sermon, amen? Oh, come on. On that great day of radical love, what's the greatest day you've ever had? Mm -hmm. Was it when your team won the Super Bowl, you know? Was, Seattle Seahawks, amen? They, they, they will win again, amen? I believe that. Was it your marriage? That great day, I mean, I remember it was like 120 degrees in the, in the room that I reserved, not knowing that the air conditioning was non-existent. It was snowing when I reserved that room, but uh, amen. That was a great day. It was a great day. What was the greatest day? You know, disciples, you hang out with disciples, and they're like, my baptism. That was my greatest day, right? May 21st, 1989. When's yours? You know what I mean? Whisper it to next, someone next to you. When's, you. when's the greatest day, that day of your baptism? I mean, you guys are smiling under your mask, because I know you are. So what if there was a day that was greater than that day? Oh, teacher. What if there was a day that made all the other days pale in comparison to that day? I believe there is a day, and it's called that great day in the Bible. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. Come on, Let's go. Let's go. You know, for a group of fired up disciples who are just baptizing uh, their brains out, you know, w there's a really only one thing I can tell you, yeah. All right. that, that I'm inspired, yeah. but I know Satan's schemes. Yeah. I know he wants us to forget about what we should be looking ahead to. Right. And, you know, you can baptize a hundred people in a hundred days. And still, Satan wants you to forget the one day that means more than anything else. First Thessalonians 5, verse 1, it says, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape but you. Brothers and sisters, are not in the darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. Amen. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Come on. What's going to build this group of Thessalonians? Their faith had been reported all over the world. Yeah. They, they, every creature under heaven had heard. In Colossians it says that. And, but the, these guys, their faith was reported. It was amazing. Wow. Paul praised them for it. I praise you for your faith. Come on. And what does he remind them of? He reminds them who they are. Yeah. He reminds them that, you know what? In order to belong to the day, there's some, some characteristics, some symptoms, if you will. Of people who belong to the day. What are the, what are the symptoms? Sobriety. Amen. Sober. Faithful. Amen. Loving. Hopeful. Come on. Ready for battle. Are you ready for battle today? Come on. Are you ready for battle in November? Come on. Yeah. What is God going to do through us in November? All right. And you know, one of the things I always have to go back to is who am I in Christ? 
Because you know, the world just wants to tell you who you are. Mm. The world wants to tell you who you aren't. Mm. And there's so much comparison that goes on. You know, we get images just flashed into our brains. Thousands upon thousands. They say there's tens of thousands of images. By the time that uh, a, a child is like eight, that they've just been brainwashed into thinking, this is what you need to look like. This is what you need to be. This is the way you're going to be happy. Yeah. Just commercialism. Yeah. And yet, what, what, who are we? You know who I am? Come on, Chris. I'm a son of the light. Come on. Come on. Come on. I belong to the day. Mm-hmm. Say that for once. Yeah. I belong to the day. Yeah. Yeah. Does that feel good? Yeah. I mean, you want more confidence in your life yeah. as a disciple even. I know for me, I just realized as before I became a Christian, I was at Yale. I was, uh, you know, had a little resume going on that I would show everybody so no one could see the real me, right? You just hide behind your resume, right? And, uh, oh, all state orchestra right there. Did you see that one? Yeah, yeah, all state soccer. Honorable mention. I don't usually say the honorable mention part. But you know what I'm saying? You share, you share with people. And yet, none of that gives you real confidence. Right, right, right. And I learned that, man, I need confidence. Come on. Man. I need confidence to live this life the way I want to. And God wants us to have the confidence. God wants us to have the confidence of being a daughter yes. of the day. A son of the day. Love that. And I, I really believe this is something that we, we kind of sleep on. Amen, no pun intended. You know, it, it's just, it just can, it can be elusive. And here Paul is reminding a great church who they are. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. So the first point is, be woke to God's radical love. Oh, okay. oh wake up now. <laughs> be woke. And 2 Corinthians 6, I don't have time to preach that one. But it's so incredible because it says there is a day of salvation. Come on. And when is it? It's today. But we're not supposed to look just at today. How dare you live for just today? Right. How dare you live for yesterday? No, the Bible says you live for that day. Mm. When Jesus returns, there's going to be a trumpet sound. I play the trumpet. I don't have a trumpet right now or else I'd play it for you. Come on. I mean, there's going to be a trumpet sound. No one's going to miss it. Non-Christian or Christian. Yeah. And everyone's going to know. And that's the day we mm. look forward to. Come on. Guys, gotta, we we got to be woke to God's radical yes. love. Awesome. And you know, we saw some radical love over the weekend. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. We saw some husbands and wives recommitting to each other. That's right. Just to give that radical. What does radical mean? It means radical means root. Yeah. Yeah. And so you get back to the root. What distinguishes you from the world? Yeah. Mm. That's what radical is. Come on, Chris. You know, I think the most radical thing is consistency. That's it. How consistent are you in living for the day? Do you see what I'm saying? Sometimes we go weeks, maybe even months, without remembering that Jesus is going to return on one day. Right. One day it's going to happen. Yep. We, we, that's what we're supposed to be looking forward to. Right. And I really believe when we do set our minds on that day, we're going to be woke. We're going we're gonna to be ready. And, and that's the way that God wants us to live. Amen. You know, there was a, a young, maybe four or five years old, uh, a friend of ours, his, their son, and he was playing in one of those McDonald's play pits, right? The ball pit. You, ever, you see that? I think they take most of them out. It's like super like, uh, you know, sue me, you know. <laughs> but uh, but they, he was playing and there was a, an older kid who was bullying him. And he kept coming back to his mom. He pushed me. And she was like, go talk to him. Tell him you, you don't like that. Tell him you want to play with him. So you go back, pushed him again. <laughs> she, he comes back. He's like crying now. He's like, mom, this, this is not fun. He's pushing me. And then she says, son, you go tell him that God is with you. <laughs> this is five years old. So he goes back. He picks up one ball in one hand. Picks up another ball in the other hand. And he goes over to this kid. God is with me! And the kid runs off. I mean, just his confidence alone. And his mom was like, whoa! 
took it to another level. You got to be woke to God's radical love. Is that the way you share your faith? Come on. Bro. Is that the way you walk through your life, through your campus, through your job? This is how we need to be. Amen. Yeah. Second point, beware of unradical Jesus. Uh-huh. Beware of unradical Jesus. Go to Zechariah 13. Oh, no. Can I just share a few prophecies with you guys? Come on. Come on. Yeah. There's nothing to just kind of build your faith in the Bible than a good prophecy. And, you know, there's over 300 prophecies. Uh, different counts, right? But just eight prophecies. What's the odds that one man's life would fulfill eight prophecies? Okay. Anyone from Texas here? Okay, amen. So fill up Texas with silver dollars to your waist. Write your name on one of the silver dollars. Take a helicopter ride, blindfolded, and somewhere in Texas, you drop it. Then you go out of the state, you come back in, you walk around the state, the, and then you take the blindfold off, amen? amen. You're wading through the silver dollar, right? And then you pick up that same silver dollar. You find it on your first try. That's just eight prophecies being fulfilled by one man. Whoa. The likelihood of you finding that one silver dollar. Wow. Wow. So, amen, let's look at a prophecy, amen? All right. Zechariah 13. Come on. It says this, on that day, sound familiar? Verse 1, on that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. So this is way beyond ritual cleansing. Nobody in Israel had access to this purification. This was an inside out complete cleansing, a complete forgiveness. It was as if you never sinned before. You heard the term justification, right? Romans 8. We're justified by faith in Christ Jesus. Well, this, this, is, this is a term that means it's not you got forgiveness or you got let off or someone paid you. It's actually a term that means you never did what you were accused of doing, even though we all did. And this is, this is what was going on. He's, this, Israel was in a complete state of sin. They weren't turning away from it. And now there was this prophecy and Zechariah just got up and said, on that day. This is what's going to happen. There's going to be a purification. Now, we know the end of the story, right? We know Jesus came to purify us. But have you really thought about it? The Israelites heard these prophecies for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and it's really incredible. Look at, uh, we got to skip a little bit. So you can look at two verse, verse 2 through 6. And basically... The truth and people's attitude to the truth was the whole issue. Mm. And there was going to be a day where instead of just accepting what anyone said as relative truth, does that sound familiar? Everyone's truth is is truth. Whatever you think, if there is God, if there's not a God, this God, that God, it's it's all all truth. There's going to be a day when there will be truth. And it'll be in... It'll be coming so clear to people that it says a prophet, a son, will be stabbed by their father and mother because they won't accept the falsehood of the false prophecies. You guys got to beware of false teaching. Just because something has a cross on it doesn't mean it's the truth. The cross wasn't even a symbol back in the first century. No disciples wore... Uh, the equivalent to a, an electric chair for us around their neck. That would be ridiculous. The Romans perfected the cross as the most horrible, terrifying form of, of capital punishment. And so, so this prophecy is incredible. Look at Zechariah 14. I got, I got to get to the, the good stuff here. So we got to beware of false teachings, right? You got to beware of the false Jesus that can be taught. I mean, I went to church for 20 years. I never once got challenged to actually follow Jesus. I'm like, how? When I started studying the Bible and I saw these passages about, like, Mark 1, be a fisher of men. Jesus called people to be a fisher of men. And then I thought, well, how could I have been in a church for 20 years and no one ever showed me, like, the basics of following Jesus? 
And I realized pretty quickly that it was because they hadn't been taught. You can only give what you have. And so beware of any Jesus who doesn't call you to follow Him. Beware of any Jesus who doesn't call you to give up everything to follow Him. Jesus, biblical Jesus, radical Jesus, believes we can all change. We can change the very nature, the sinful nature in our lives. I went from just an incredibly impure man to having a purity that was like a weight lifted off my shoulders. Where I wasn't married for six years and I I never was impure as a single. And that's to God's glory. I was the most impure person. Mind, impure mind. And God changed me. And I I think this is what we got to do, guys. We got to beware of any Jesus that doesn't change people from the inside out. We have that Jesus. We have that Jesus. We have the Jesus who is radical. And we got to beware of anything else. Amen? The last point is be washed. To wash others in Jesus' radical blood. Amen? Be washed to wash others in Jesus' radical blood. Look at Zechariah 14. I know you're there. All right, here we go. Let's go. Zechariah 14 in verse 16. It says, Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. If any of the peoples of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, they will have no rain. Not good in an agrarian society. If the Egyptian people do not have, go up and take part, they will have no rain. The Lord will bring on them the plague He inflicts on the nations that do not go up to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not go up to celebrate the tab, uh, fe- festival of the tabernacles. Okay, that's a prophecy. Wow. It means so little to us because we're not Jewish. <laughs> it, it, so it doesn't like, oh, okay. Festival Tabernacles. I, I get it. Unless you've studied it out. So look at John 7. All right. John 7. I told you. I, prophecies get fulfilled. Amen. Amen. So let's go. John 7, verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival. Wonder what festival this is. It's the day of the Tabernacles. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. So Jesus stood... And said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of life will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit. Just in case you didn't know what the prophecy meant and how it would be fulfilled. By this he meant, thank you John, the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Guys, the last day, the Feast of the Tabernacles, Jesus gets up with the mic and drops it. It's just what Jesus does. Remember Luke 4? He's like, this prophecy, Isaiah, has just been fulfilled in your hearing. I'm him. (laughs) It's like, whoa! I wanted to kill him. That's what happens when people preach the truth. If you're persecuted, it doesn't mean you're you're actually going by the truth. But if you're not persecuted, it means you're absolutely not going by the truth. Because Jesus was persecuted for the truth. And we got to be washed in Jesus' blood to wash others. So, so how does this all come together? I love something that Joel said to the, the, the huddle up before the service. He said that the, the power of the gospel has been given to you, to us. And it's supposed to flow through us. As good news to the rest of the world. Come on. Yes. How's it flowing? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Come on, bro. We can't be dead end disciples. Uh-oh. We've got to let the spirit, the life giving spirit, flow through us. Yeah. Yes. And one of the things I decided on this retreat, I'm like, man, the Bible says to be overflowing with thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. You know, the only way to do that is if you're actually at a 10. Right? We always ask people, Psalm 119, seeking God, the first study, right? The first scripture, the first study. You're like, so how much are you seeking God with all your heart 
or with none of your heart? Zero to ten, where are you at? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we're looking for that, you know, humble response. <laughs> Eleven. No, oh, amen. <laughs> I mean, maybe someone is. Amen. But, but the only way that you can be overflowing is if you're a ten. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. The greatest false teaching, I think, in the Christianity today is that you can't be a 10 for God. Come on. Yeah. That is so false. Don't listen to anybody who says you can't give God your whole heart. Yeah. Because you're supposed to overflow with yeah. Thanksgiving. Yeah. And I decided, you know what? My wife's going to feel some Thanksgiving because it's going to overflow. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overflow on, with Thanksgiving. Yeah. I'm not going to go to a 9 and be accepted. So I'm not going to accept that. Wow, come on. I'm not going to go to a nine and a half. I'm not even going to go to 9.9. Because that's not going to overflow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go to an 11. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to challenge you. How grateful are you for the kingdom? Yeah. I mean, look at what we saw. Yeah. Look at what we saw. I wrote down so many notes from the good news email. I don't even have time to share them. Reshare them. I was like, wow. Boom, boom, like nine things that hit me. Yeah. And there was like six of them that I had. I had a, a, a part of some of those good news stories. Because we've just been around for long enough for our roots to be interlocked with other churches and other people and people, the spirit flowing through us. And it's so incredible. And I, and I really want to inspire you guys. You know, there's a, uh, a father and a son. I'll end with this. So the son... And the father had this really awesome relationship. They would go out and watch uh, race cars. And they were, there was, that was their thing. They would go out and they'd, they'd check out street rod, hot rod cars, right? And in and, and, uh, these, these shows, they'd go to these car shows. And uh, the son got older and they kept this uh, tradition up and they, they just had this bond, right? And then his, his 16th birthday, he, uh, he's super excited because he had been dropping hints for at least, you know, the last year or so, about the car that he would love to drive. 16th birthday, Dad. You know, right? So, so 16th birthday comes by, and he gets a, a present from his dad. He opens the present, and it's a Bible. And he gets so bitter. He gets angry. He basically doesn't talk to his dad for two years. He's living in the same house. 18 hits, he's out of the house. He lived away from his parents for 20 years. His dad gets sick. He doesn't come back. He's like, that guy doesn't love me. Comes back for the funeral. Sees the box of belongings. It sees this Bible sticking out of the box. He went over and picked up the Bible. He opened it up for the first time. And there was the keys to a 69 Mustang. Oh my goodness. Wow. Guys, the Father wants to give us the greatest life that we have. He wants to wash us. He wants us to, to thrive. Yeah. He wants to get us out of that pit of darkness. Mm. And what do we do? We get bitter with Him. Yeah. And we just walk away a lot of times. And maybe we walk away into like nice little Christian religion with the non-radical Jesus. Yeah. And we sit there comfortable in our own little lives. The Holy Spirit not flowing through us. Not having an impact on anyone else. Now, I know that's not a lot of us. But guys, we cannot lose the vision for people changing. We've got to say, you know what? Be washed. In every Bible study that you sit down with someone, whether it's seeking God or the Word or discipleship, whatever Bible study it is, you believe that person can be washed. Every person, every sin can be washed. Amen? You know, I just want to conclude... It's been incredible. It's been incredible being here. We, uh, there's a song uh, we sung at the, at the retreat, and it's, it's hallelujah. And the first verse goes, Lord, we sing your praises loud. Sing them to a stumbling crowd. Sing of Jesus and his word. Sing until the earth has heard. heard. The last verse, life is but a passing glance. Seek him while you have the chance.
We are made of naught but clay till we're changed on that great day. Praise God. To God be the glory.